Hi, this is chapter 25 from PS100 about nuclear processes. And you're listening to a little bit of U2 because it's from How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb. But let's cut that out and just move on. I want to remind you that exam three is available at the testing center starting Monday, which reminds me that I need to call and find out why my submission didn't work. The deadline will be closing of the testing center on Friday the 13th of March, and it will cover chapters 18 through 25. Our story about the nucleus begins with talking about the Rutherford experiment, which we talked about earlier. You'll remember that the Rutherford experiment involved uh, a source of alpha particles in a little lead box which had a little hole in the end that created a beam of alpha particles that were allowed to hit a very thin piece of gold foil. And the alpha particles were scattered as they went through the gold foil. There was a detector behind the foil that would record where the alpha particles hit and produce a little glowing spot and the screen was movable so you could move it around and measure the angles that the alpha particles were deflected through and to everyone's surprise some of the alpha particles were deflected through very large angles um, and this of course was the discovery of the atomic nucleus alpha particles as we'll see today are really just helium nuclei so they have uh, two protons and two neutrons, and they are positively charged. They have a plus two charge. And so the fact that they get deflected um, means that there has to be something uh, strongly positively charged to produce the repulsive forces to cause that backward scattering. And it also had to be very small because most of the alpha particles just went right on through the gold foil and didn't hit anything. And uh, that was one of the landmark experiments. So summarizing what we know about the nucleus. From the Rutherford experiment, we know that the nucleus is very small. We know that it contains multiple positive charges. And in fact, all the, the positive charge in the atom is in the nucleus. But that begs a really important question. Positive charges repel each other. And so what can hold those positive charges so close together? Remember, the positive charge is due to protons in the nucleus. And the only thing that can hold those positive charges together and keep them from flying apart because they repel each other is some other force. And the other force today we call the strong nuclear force. Now, in addition to protons, there are neutrons in the nucleus. They are neutral particles that have roughly the same mass as uh, protons do. They were discovered a lot later because it's harder to detect things that are neutral. And neutrons contribute to the strong nuclear force without uh, any causing any electromagnetic repulsion. So they kind of act like glue to hold the nucleus together. However, if you have too many of them, that's not good either. And we don't really know all the reasons why. So why do you think neutrons were discovered after protons? Well, the right answer to this is B. Charged particles like protons are a lot easier to detect because they produce signals in electronic devices. Neutral particles don't produce signals nearly as easily. Well, keep in mind that all the rules that we've been talking about in this class, we're going to keep coming back to these fundamental rules over and over. All of them still have to apply. So what are the things that must apply to atomic nuclei? Well, the electromagnetic force law hasn't been repealed. Protons do repel each other. And the various conservation laws have to be obeyed, too. So we know that charge is conserved. We never create or destroy charge. We know that mass number is conserved. Remember, mass number is the number of nucleons, or protons plus neutrons, um, in the nucleus of the atom, because that corresponds to most of the mass of the atom. The atom also has electrons, but they are about one two thousandth as massive as the nucleons. So the mass is nearly all due to the protons and neutrons in the nucleus. Another thing that has to be conserved is mass energy, and I'll have a little more to say about that later in the lecture. Wave particle duality is obeyed for these kinds of particles. So protons and neutrons behave both like waves and like particles. 
in the sense that they are waves of probability just like the electrons are but because their mass is much larger than the mass of the electron that means that their wavelength lambda is a lot smaller than the wavelength for electrons and that means it's a little bit harder to observe the wave nature of protons and neutrons than it is to see the wave nature of electrons the exclusion principle also applies. I'm not sure if you'll remember that, but that was the idea that if you have multiple electrons in an orbital, well, first of all, you can only have two electrons per orbital, and if you have two electrons in the same orbital, they have to have different quantum mechanical spin. That is, every electron has to have a unique quantum mechanical state. And the same thing is true for protons and neutrons, although we know a lot less about the details for them than we do about electrons. All right. It's useful, I think, to compare the atomic model, the model for the atom that we've already developed, with the, the emerging model for the atomic nucleus. So you remember for atoms, uh, atoms have electrons, and the energies of the electrons are were first determined by doing experiments. We shine lights on atoms and we saw that only certain wavelengths were absorbed and only certain wavelengths were emitted. They happen to be the same wavelengths. So remember you get line spectra when you excite atoms. You don't see all the colors of the rainbow. You just see certain discrete lines. Uh, Rydberg looked at those lines and recognized that there was a pattern in the lines and was able to write down a formula that predicted where the lines should be. Um, that led to a quantum mechanical model for the atom, that and other things. And the result of all of that is that we can now calculate the energies of all the electrons in any atom exactly by using the electric force laws and the equations for wave behavior. Remember, the force law for the electromagnetic force is given down here. It's a minus, whoops, that minus sign shouldn't be there. That's a mistake, sorry. It's a constant times the product of the two charges, Q is charge, divided by the separation between the charges squared. Um, and that's a well-known thing. Now let's compare that with the model we have for the nucleus. The atomic nucleus has energy levels just like the atom does. So you can excite a nucleus and there are only certain energy levels that are possible. However, um, we haven't found clear patterns in the nuclear energy levels like we did for electrons and that makes it difficult to figure out what's really going on in the nucleus. Um, they have begun to develop a model for the atomic nucleus based on the strong nuclear force just like the atomic model is based on the electromagnetic force and it resembles the model for the atom in that um, it has a lot of quantum mechanical properties but one big problem with this is we don't have an equation that completely describes the strong nuclear force so force strong nuclear equals question mark. Since we don't know exactly how the strong force works, it's not possible yet to calculate the different energy levels in the atomic nucleus. And so we're talking about stuff today that's on the very edge of science, nuclear physics. Okay, question for you. What's the relationship between mass and energy? Do you remember this from things we've looked at before? Pause this and try and answer it. Do you remember that energy and mass are directly proportional to each other? Of course, this comes from the most famous equation ever written, which is Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared. Notice that energy and mass are directly proportional, and the proportionality constant is the speed of light, c, squared. So it's a huge number. What does this mean? Well, it means that a little bit of mass corresponds to a huge amount of energy. And you remember the answer to this, natural systems always tend toward blank energies. Pause and answer. I hope you remembered that natural systems always move towards lower energy. So A, lower, is the right answer to this. And that leads us to 
Well, something that'll help us to understand the, the way that uh, atomic nuclei behave. This graph is one you're going to see over and over throughout this lecture. What's plotted on it is atomic mass number across the x-axis. There aren't any actual numbers there because you don't really need the numbers. Remember the atomic mass number is just a uh, number of protons plus neutrons in the nucleus. And on the y-axis is the average mass of the protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And what you see happening is if you start at very low atomic mass numbers, so up here would be hydrogen, the average nucleon mass is quite large by comparison. It falls, there's some little jag jiggies and jaggies in it. The minimum is at iron, and then from iron on, the average nucleon mass goes up. Uh, blue points are stable isotopes, and red po points are radioactive isotopes. So if mass decreases, what does that tell you about energy? Well, we just saw in the questions that energy and mass are directly proportional to each other. So if the mass is going down, so is the energy. Why do you think that the graph goes down so steeply over here in the beginning? Well, it has to be that the energy is decreasing very rapidly at the beginning, and that has something to do with the strong nuclear force. And keep in mind that in hydrogen, where there's only one proton in the nucleus, the strong nuclear force can't do anything because it involves binding of nuclear particles to each other, and in hydrogen there's only one. So no strong nuclear force contribution, and then it starts to kick in as we start adding neutrons and protons to the nucleus. So what that says is that the strong nuclear force uh, is uh, really large per nucleon for the low mass atoms. So instead of putting mass on the y-axis, we could just as well put nuclear potential energy per nucleon, so I'm dividing the total potential energy by the number of nucleons, and it's really large for hydrogen. Well, partly because I'm only dividing by one there. I have to divide this one by two, this one by three, and so on. But notice it falls to a minimum and then comes back up. So where's the potential energy the greatest in this graph? Well, it's obviously up here, the very first element, which is hydrogen. And for what element is it the least? Well, it's the one that has this Fe symbol, which stands for ferrum, which is the Latin for iron. So iron is the element for which the potential energy is the very least. That's going to turn out to be important later on uh, when we talk about stars, so don't forget iron. What's going on over here for the heavy atoms? Why do you think the average masses increase with mass number for elements heavier than iron? Well, what has to be happening there is that we are going uphill in energy because, well, the nuclear binding force is increasing, but it's not increasing as fast as the mass number is, and therefore the potential energy for these nuclei goes up as you get above iron. That's going to have a really important implication for splitting atoms and rele releasing energy, nuclear fission. So what about the fact that up here the, uh, all the nuclei are radioactive? What does that tell us about the nuclear strong force's range? Well, it can't be very long range because remember as you go to the right here and you add more and more particles to the atomic nucleus, the nucleus gets larger. And once it gets too large, uh, the strong nuclear force is not able to hold it together anymore. That's why all of these things are radioactive. They fall apart typically by these nuclei splitting into two smaller nuclei. So the strong force is very short range. It operates over distances that are comparable to the size of an atomic nucleus. What does it tell us about the strength? Well, through here, the strong force is stronger than the electromagnetic force, and actually down here too, because the nucleus doesn't fall apart. But once the nucleus gets too big, the range is short, and 
um, the nuclei fall apart. That's what we learn from this end of the graph. So why does the graph cut off sharply over here? Well, because these nuclei get so big that you can't hold them together at all. So again, the nuclear strong forces range is, well, smaller than the size of these very large atomic nuclei. Um, it's quite strong. It's stronger than the electromagnetic force, but if you get too large, um, it can't handle it because the range is short. What's going on over here with the light atoms? So how does the mass of a proton in hydrogen here uh, compare to the mass of a proton in helium, which is here? I hope you can see from the graph that the helium protons weigh quite a bit less than the hydrogen proton does. How do the nuclear potential energies compare? Well, hydrogen has very high nuclear potential energy and helium has uh, much lower. In fact, it's sort of especially low. It drops down here and then it goes up if you start adding more stuff to it. Um, how do nuclear forces explain stuff like this? Well, there are no nuclear forces operating in hydrogen because it's just a proton. And remember, the strong nuclear force holds protons and neutrons together, and that can't happen if there's only one. But it looks like when you get four, two protons plus two neutrons in helium, things are very strongly bound together because the potential energy has dropped way down. If you put another neutron on, um, that's not as good, and the energy goes up and then it starts to come back down again eventually. All right. So why do you think it's hard to achieve nuclear fusion? I guess I haven't explained what nuclear fusion is. Fusion is where you take two light atomic nuclei, like two hydrogen atoms, and push them together so that you produce a heavier atomic nuclei, nucleus, say for instance helium, which has two protons in its nucleus. Why do you think it's hard to do that? Let me pause and let you answer. The best answer to this is A. The fusing nuclei are both positive. They are. And what force then has to operate between them? Well, the electromagnetic force. And since they're both positive, that pushes them apart. And so it's really hard to get the two nuclei close enough together for the strong nuclear force to kick in and pull them together and release all that potential energy. Uh, dilithium crystals don't have anything to do with it. Uh, elements of the right type for fusion are not rare. In fact, they're very common. Seawater is full of hydrogen, which could be used for fusion. For fusion. And nuclear waste from fusion, hard to get rid of. It turns out that fusion doesn't produce any nuclear waste. Uh, hydrogen fusion produces helium, which is completely inert. So if we could get fusion to work, that would be a huge benefit to society. Unfortunately, we don't know how to do it very well yet. Um, before we talk about fusion more, I want to show you how to write nuclear reactions. Now, we don't expect you to uh, be able to do this from scratch, but we do expect you to be able to look at these reactions and sort of understand what they mean. So this first one is for a typical fusion reaction between two hydrogen atoms. Now, these are not normal hydrogen atoms. This is hydrogen 2, which is called deuterium. It's a special isotope of hydrogen that has one proton and one neutron in its nucleus. The, so the 2 up here is the mass number, which tells you how many heavy particles there are, or how many particles there are in the nucleus, protons plus neutrons. The number down below here is the atomic number. That's the charge on the nucleus, and it's also equal to the number of protons in the nucleus, because the protons are the only thing in the nuclei that are charged, and they're all positively charged. So... This is a heavy hydrogen atom. It's got an extra neutron. And this is another one. This one's called tritium. So remember, dut means two, deuterium. Tritium, tri, means three. Tritium has three nucleons in its nucleus, one proton and two neutrons. And you can get those two to fuse together to produce helium. Helium has two protons in its nucleus, the two down here, and it has 
two additional neutrons, so its mass number is four. Now, one of the things that's always conserved is mass number, and so if I took five nuclear particles on the left side of the arrow here and produced helium with only four, I've got to have something else. The something else is a neutron, which is what this n is, and the neutron has a mass number of one. It's got one neutron. Its atomic number is zero because it has no protons. So notice that the mass numbers on the left side of the equation, 2 plus 3 equals 5, have to add up to the same thing as the mass numbers on the right side of the equation, 4 plus 1 equals 5. That's the law of conservation of mass being obeyed. By the same token, the atomic numbers on the left, 1 plus 1 equals 2, have to equal the sum of the atomic numbers on the right of the arrow, 2 plus 0 equals 2. That's the conservation of charge being obeyed because each of these atomic numbers represents a plus one charge. We call a reaction like this where two nuclei combine to make one heavier nucleus nuclear fusion. The other reaction down here is a different type of reaction. In this one we have uranium. Uranium is a way heavier element. It has 235 protons and neutrons in its nucleus, with 92 of them being protons. And if you collide uranium-235 with a slow neutron, which of course has a mass number of 1 and an atomic number of 0, you can make the uranium-235 very unstable so that it splits into two smaller nuclei. In this case, it splits into xenon-140 and strontium-94 and emits two other neutrons. Notice that once again these laws that I'm talking about are obeyed. 235 plus 1 is 236. Over here on the product side, 140 plus 94 plus 1 plus 1 is 236 again, so mass is conserved. Similarly, 92 plus 0 is obviously 92, and 54 plus 38 plus 0 plus 0 is also 92, so charge is also conserved. So reading these nuclear reactions really just involves um, balancing so that the charge and the mass number, not the mass, are conserved. Because what we're going to see is mass itself is not conserved in these reactions. Um, but the mass number and the charge numbers are. Okay, let's continue. So let's talk about nuclear fusion. In nuclear fusion we combine two small nuclei to make a larger one and in the process we release energy. So if you think back to that graph we were just looking at, we start on the high part with hydrogen, you know, with uh, a mass number of two or three and we combine those together and make helium with a mass number of four and if you remember that graph the helium is much lower in nuclear potential energy than are this kind of hydrogen which is called deuterium or this kind which is called tritium and so you're going downhill in potential energy because energy is conserved you have to release energy in some form and it's typically released as the kinetic energy of the helium and the neutron that are produced. Um, so remember that nuclei do have positive charges. These two hydrogen nuclei each have one proton. The gray ball is a proton. And that means you need a large force to push them together somehow, or you need to collide them with high enough energies that you can overcome the electromagnetic repulsion. Now, we do know how to do controlled nuclear fusion, but currently it costs more energy to push the nuclei together than is released in the fusion reaction. Well, actually, that's not exactly true. Where we are right now with controlled fusion is right about at the break-even point where we get out about the same amount of energy as we have to put in to make the reaction happen. For fusion to become economically viable to produce energy, it's got to be a lot better than just break-even. Break-even's where we are now. Of course, there are a couple of fusion reactors that work really well. Uh, hydrogen bombs are fusion reactors. 
Uh, unfortunately, that kind of fusion is not controlled and not very useful for producing power. Uh, another fusion reactor that works is shown here on the right. Uh, this is the Earth's Sun, which is a giant nuclear fusion reactor, as are all the stars in the universe. And this is actually the source of almost all the energy that we use on the Earth. All fossil fuels, you know, hydrocarbons, gasoline, natural gas, uh, all of those are really just chemically stored forms of energy that has come from the sun that was ultimately produced by nuclear fusion in the sun. So the light atoms, we're taking you know, this one and this one and putting them together and going all the way down here and releasing large amounts of energy, that's fusion. But you can go the other direction too. Um, Here's where uranium is on our graph. What's the mass of a proton in uranium compared to the mass of a proton in xenon? I think you can see that the uranium proton on average weighs more than the xenon proton does. That means that the nuclear potential energy for the particles in the uranium nucleus is greater than the potential energy for the particles in the xenon nucleus. So how do nuclear forces explain this? Well, um, it means that it's downhill in potential energy to go from uranium to xenon, so that's another potential source of energy. So the strong nuclear force is um, greater in the xenon atom than it is in the uranium atom. And why is that? Well, in the uranium atom, the nucleons are too far apart. In xenon, they're closer together, and so it goes downhill <clears throat> to go from uranium to xenon. <clears throat> so we can take advantage of that in a process called nuclear fission. I talked about it before when I showed the reaction, but what happens in fission is we start with the uranium-235 nucleus, which is huge compared to the ones we were talking about earlier, hydrogen and deuterium and tritium. And uranium-235 is already radioactive, but it's only slowly radioactive. However, if you add an additional neutron to it, then it becomes much more radioactive, and it spontaneously splits into two smaller nuclei. In this case, xenon-140 and strontium-94. And in the process of doing that, it also releases two more neutrons. Hmm. What could you do with these two neutrons that are produced? Well, you can take those neutrons and collide them with another uranium-235 nucleus, causing it to split, which produces two more, and you can use those to split, split some more, and you end up producing what we call a nuclear chain reaction, where the splitting of this one releases neutrons that cause splitting of more and more and more, and so pretty soon they all go off. Now, you can control this reaction because it only works if the neutron that is hitting the uranium-235 is not moving too fast. And so you put stuff in your reactor that slows down the neutrons because when they come out of this, they're coming out very fast, too fast to cause the chain reaction. So you have to add things that slow them down, and the amount of stuff you add that slows them down controls whether the reaction goes or not. And what happens in this reaction is you produce new uh, isotopes that aren't normally found in nature. So if nuclear fission has occurred somewhere, um, by measuring the isotopes, you can tell that it's happened. Let's take a look at uh, this nuclear chain reaction. So here's what nuclear fission looks like. It's modeled in this video with uh, mouse traps and ping pong balls. So the ping pong balls represent the neutron, and if the neutron comes in and hits the first mouse trap in such a way that it goes off, well, that emits a couple more neutrons that are spit off the the mousetrap, and you'll see it go really fast, and they'll also show it in slow motion. So here we go. Nuclear chain reactions are the basis of nuclear power and nuclear weapons. We'll use this set of mousetraps to demonstrate how a chain reaction works. Each mousetrap has been set, then loaded with two ping pong balls. Each mousetrap represents an atomic nucleus, 
while the ping-pong balls represent neutrons inside the atomic nuclei. When a single ping-pong ball is dropped inside, a chain reaction begins. Here it is again in slow motion. So that's a very simple model, but it shows you how nuclear fission works. Nuclear fission is the way that we produce nuclear power. And uh, you know, today we don't hear very much about it because people are afraid of uh, nuclear power. But there are currently in the United States 104 operating nuclear reactors. As you can see, most of them are in the eastern part of the United States, though there are a few in Arizona and California and some up in Washington. None at all in Utah. Nuclear power as of 2013 uh, represented 19.4% of the energy that is produced in, in the United States, well, in the form of electricity. Uh, the biggest source of electricity is still coal, followed by natural gas. But keep in mind that when we burn coal or natural gas, those both produce energy by producing carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas and leads to global climate change. We'll have more to say about that in another chapter. And so, yes, there are risks associated with nuclear power because you do produce waste when you do nuclear fission. You make those unusual, unusual don't exist in nature, radioactive isotopes and they stay radioactive for tens of thousands of years. And so you've got to do something about that. The other problem with nuclear fission is that that material, the uranium and the plutonium that are used in fission reactors, uh, can also easily be used to make nuclear weapons. And so another great fear is if we get a lot of nuclear fuel floating around out there, terrorists could get a hold of it and build bombs that would be really terrible. And so you uh, security around a nuclear power plant is also something that's a very great concern. Um, so there are trade-offs to these different types of power sources. Interestingly, about 13 percent of power comes from what we call renewable sources. That includes things like hydroelectric power, uh, solar power, wind power, many other sources. Um, it's hard to do those very economically. All right, let's take a close look at the bottom part of our graph where, we're, again, we're plotting average nucleon mass versus atomic number. And you see the minimum happens at iron. It's interesting that there are a number of places on the graph where there are two or three different nuclei that have the same mass number. Of course, that means they uh, have different combinations of protons or neutrons in them. Um, but we call these cases where you can get multiple forms of the same thing isotopes. And I've been using, I've been referring to isotopes uh, all along throughout the lecture. I guess it's time that I talked about what they are. One thing that's interesting is we don't get all possible combinations of protons and neutrons in the atomic nucleus. Only certain ones are stable enough to be observed. Some of them are completely stable. They're not radioactive at all. And some of them are extremely radioactive. But the question is, why do you get only certain combinations of protons plus neutrons? And unfortunately, that's a question that we can't completely answer yet. It definitely is buried somewhere in the details of nuclear physics and of nuclear quantum mechanics. But as I mentioned earlier, those are things that we don't understand very well yet. However, what we do know is that certain combinations tend to not be radioactive other combinations are, and the degree of radioactivity changes. And of course, if a nucleus is radioactive, that means it's changing into another kind of nucleus. So isotopes are um, nuclei that have the same number of protons, 
That means they're the same element because the number of protons in the atomic nucleus is what defines what kind of element you have. However, isotopes have different numbers of neutrons, and that means that they have different masses. And we've already seen an example of that with hydrogen. Normal hydrogen has only one proton in its nucleus, so nearly all hydrogen atoms are this kind. But it is possible to add a neutron to the nucleus of hydrogen atom, to, um, and that makes deuterium. Notice it's still hydrogen because it's still got only one proton. Uh, this form of hydrogen is naturally occurring and uh, is, is uh, not radioactive. It exists in, in seawater. It's a small fraction of uh, the hydrogen that's in, in uh, the water in the ocean. But there's enough there that uh, there's enough nuclear fuel to last nearly forever. Uh, another form of hydrogen we saw before is called tritium. Tritium has three nucleons, one proton again, so it's still hydrogen, and two neutrons, and this stuff is radioactive. It also occurs in nature, but it's much rarer than deuterium. And uh, one of the things people have talked about is uh, mining tritium from the moon, because there's a lot of it in the crust of the moon uh, from the solar wind, which has deposited it there. The reason you'd want to mine tritium is that fusion between tritium and deuterium is much easier to accomplish than is fusion between normal hydrogen and normal hydrogen or normal hydrogen and deuterium. So this might be a valuable nuclear fuel in the future if we can figure out how to make nuclear fusion work in a controlled way to produce energy. So what about the isotopes that are missing? Why are they missing? Well, we've noticed that not all combinations of protons and neutrons occur. And even when uh, naturally occurring nuclear fission happens, we don't find all the byproducts of that. There are certain combinations of protons and neutrons that, that don't stick around. And we've said before that according to the second law of thermodynamics, nature favors whatever state has the most disorder. Well. Shouldn't that mean you should get every possible combination of neutrons and protons and things would be really disordered? And the answer is, yeah, when an atom splits, you probably do get every possible combination, or at least you get a lot of them. Um, again, it's got to be governed somewhat by the rules of uh, nuclear quantum mechanics that we don't understand. But you ought to get a wide number of possibilities. Why don't we see them all? Because we certainly don't. So. Why don't we see them all? Well, because some of the combinations are extremely radioactive. That means they're unstable, and they disappear very quickly by converting into other things. And uh, so what happens to those randomly generated isotopes that we don't see? Well, they change into other kinds of atoms or other kinds of nuclei that have less nuclear potential energy or less mass, which is the same thing. And that energy is released as heat. And of course, this change, like all the other things we've talked about all through the course, has to, be, to obey all of the laws we've been talking about. So remember that one of those laws is the conservation of mass energy. That is, the total mass energy before a reaction has to be the same as the total you get after the reaction. And that includes nuclear decay processes. So when um, a nucleus decays into new nuclei that have less mass, you have to release energy. Because if the mass goes down, well, you, you never lose mass. There has to be a production of energy that goes along with it. Also remember, conservation of charge is obeyed. I've said that before. So the total charge before and after our decay process or any nuclear reaction has to stay the same. So that leads to three generally known types of radioactive decay. We've talked before about alpha particles. And what happens in an alpha decay is a nucleus emits a group of two protons and two neutrons, which is a helium nucleus. Why does it tend to do that? Well, you remember in our graph where helium is at the bottom of that deep uh, jag? A helium nucleus is especially stable for some reason, and so alpha particles are very frequently emitted. Heavy nuclei like uranium tend to decay by alpha decay. 
Another type of decay is called beta. They just named these in the order they were discovered. So alpha was first and then beta, uh, after the Greek letters alpha, beta, and then the third one is gamma. So beta decay involves a proton in a nucleus changing into a neutron, or it can go the other way. A neutron can change into a proton, and obviously that looks like a problem because protons have positive charges and neutrons have negative charges. That means that if this process happens, there has to be a charged particle emitted as well. And the charged particle is either an electron or its antiparticle, which is called a positron. And what causes beta decay is the weak nuclear force, and uh, that's really poorly understood. So this is about all I'm going to say about the weak nuclear force throughout the whole course. Uh, the third type of K decay is called a gamma decay, and gamma decay is emission of a high-energy photon. So if you get protons or neutrons or both that are in a high quantum energy level in the nucleus, and that energy level relaxes to a lower energy level, you have to emit a photon, just like in an atom, when electrons in a high energy level decay or fall into a lower energy level, you emit a photon. The difference is that in a nucleus, the energies involved are much larger than they are in the atom, and so uh, gamma, gamma rays are very high energy photons. So there are three types of radioactive decay. Alpha is emission of a helium nucleus. Beta involves emission of an electron or a positron, and gamma involves emission of a photon. And you should know these three processes. So let's think about alpha decay a little bit. In an alpha decay, a helium nucleus, which is two protons and two neutrons, is emitted. What has to be true of the other product of the reaction? Think about that for a second. Pause your recording and answer it, and then I'll tell you. Okay, let's look at the possible answers. The other product can't go up in mass because it's losing um, two protons and two neutrons, which are heavy. It has to go down in mass, so A can't be correct. B says it must have an atomic number two less than the original nucleus. Well, if you remember the definition of atomic number, that's the number of protons in the nucleus, and we said that that is that the, the mass number or atomic number, uh, both of those are conserved. And so this has to be true because the helium nucleus has two protons. So that means that the atomic number has to go down by two because the atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus. C says the other product must have higher energy than the original nucleus. Nope, that's not true. Nature always goes in the direction of lower energy. So that's not what happens. All right, I believe that's everything um, that you need to know from the chapter on nuclear processes. So uh, good luck, and uh, good luck with the exam.